In this video I'll be talking about new and smart materials or modern materials and smart materials as they're sometimes called and how they're uh, used and how they differ from each other. Uh, I'm going to give some examples of some of the properties and applications or uses of some of these materials and I'm going to talk a bit about composite materials as well, a definition and some examples of those. Okay, So um, if we talk about some new materials um, that you should be aware of first, okay. Uh, one example of this would be graphene. Okay, so graphene is uh, very, very new as a material. Okay, it's effectively a wafer-thin layer of carbon um, that's only been developed very, very recently. Um, and again, they're, they're still kind of looking for applications for how um, this this material can be used. Okay, but effectively. Um, it is a very very strong and a very very lightweight material okay so one of the the uses that they've applied it to at the moment or applications is in the strengthening of lightweight tennis rackets okay so you'll have a very wafer thin layer of uh, graphene applied to the uh, tennis racket to form as a sort of a composite composite material and it kind of benefits the strength uh, of the racket without adding undue weight so obviously in that sort of application with tennis you want to be able to swing your arm around uh, quite freely you want to be able to apply the maximum amount of power to the ball okay it's ideal for that sort of thing but you also want that strength because obviously the ball is going to strike it at such uh, force if you're hitting it hard with the tennis racket so it's going to offer some benefits there Another material you should be familiar with is uh, the uh, invention of metal foams uh, they are kind of as they say effectively it's metal that's been aerated or produced into like a foam so if you imagine like a honeycomb that you might know from your crunchy bar or um, a foam that like you, you might realize is in upholstery in a seat or something okay it's got those aerated elements where gas has been sort of inserted in or blown into the, the material now metal foams um, obviously offer a lot of the, the properties of metals as in they're quite strong um, they can be quite tough and hard and uh, offer all these sort of benefits but by blowing that air in to create the gas you effectively create something that is quite hard and quite strong but also uh, remains very lightweight okay so there's um, in terms of applications they're starting to look at how these can be used uh, for certain car parts to reduce the weight and therefore potentially increase um, efficiency of the car uh, and also in bone plant uh, implants in medical treatment and things like this where you want to create like a, a structure such as a, a replacement for a, um, a bone effectively um, and these can obviously they off, offer that similar strength and hardness of bone but obviously maintain that lightness because bone as a material obviously has some of those properties as well it's quite light if you break inside it's quite a hollow uh, strong light material as well uh, titanium is another material. It's not. It's not new. I mean, it's it's on the periodic table. It's a, It's an element. But the use of titanium in uh, products has been quite uh, recent because mainly titanium is a very hard. Uh, a very strong material and therefore it makes it quite hard to work with so again like with the metal foams part titanium is being used for um, medical implants again because it's strength and it's toughness but also probably the fact that it won't react or corrode when it's in a an environment such as inside the body and it won't react with you it won't be um, toxic or or cause problems there um, it's also being implemented again in vehicles so things like bikes and uh, car parts and things like this as well because although it's uh, um, in, in many ways stronger than sort of steel and aluminium it's also quite lightweight as well so you can produce very very strong and lightweight um, products liquid crystal displays or LCDs you might be quite familiar with okay these are found in televisions and computer screens again a relatively new material or a new sort of application there okay but being aware that the fact that these are being used there is useful for your uh, GCSE and we've talked quite a lot about um, metals, okay? But metals often are coated or plated in some cases to um, apply, apply either a, a protective layer or a decorative coating. So um, there's many ways that you can um, coat metals with other metals, okay? But you're probably quite familiar with electroplating or chromium plating or chrome plating. You might find this on cars where you've got those sort of shiny accents or details. If you think about like those American cars and things that have those detailings, that's an example of chromium uh, electroplating there. Okay, um, you'll also be perhaps familiar with other or less familiar with other terms such as galvanizing and anodizing. So galvanizing is basically electroplating with a coating of zinc, and anodizing occurs 
to create an oxide layer to build up colour or a protective layer on aluminium. Other developments in materials uh, include the use of nanomaterials, which are basically tiny particles of materials that are being implemented into various different applications to enhance properties again, a bit like the use of composite materials there to enhance properties. So one example of uh, nanomaterials, I mean we've talked about where graphene is being brought into uh, certain applications, you could argue that, that is like a the use of nanomaterials in the, the thin application of carbon. Okay, but uh, silver nanoparticles are also used because obviously silver has antibacterial properties. So you might have noticed if you've gone to the chemist recently, you might have your um, um, plasters that have silver particles inside and that's because it's got that antibacterial properties. And they're even stitching or um, applying silver nanoparticles into clothing and things for the same sort of reason. I mean, you know, we get hot, we get sweaty, bacteria kind of thrives in these sort of environments and we want to make sure that we can keep ourselves fresh so uh, the silver particles, the nanomaterials there in clothing can offer these sort of benefits as well. Now, moving on to smart materials. Now, the definition of a smart material um, effectively is a material that will change according to its environment or according to uh, external stimulus. Now, these sort of stimuli might be heat, it might be water, it might be electricity, um, it could be a range of different things, pressure, okay? And it will change the properties of the material, it will react in a different way based on these things, but it's smart, it remembers what it was before, so therefore when that external stimulus is stopped or it's taken out of that environment, it will revert back to its original uh, state. Now, one example of smart material that you should be aware of is shape memory alloy, or it's sometimes abbreviated to SMA. Okay, it's sometimes called smart wire. Okay, um, and the material is quite often nitinol, which is a mixture of uh, nickel and titanium. It's uh, an alloy, effectively. Now. SMA or shape memory alloy um, is affected by heat or in some cases affected by electricity. Now the application of uh, these shape memory alloys, uh, some of the things you might be aware of is bone fixings and glasses frames. Now bone fixings is, is like what it says effectively, in a medical operation you sometimes need to fix bone together, okay, like hip replacements, knee replacements, things like this. And the use of smart wire in this application is good because Unlike um, normal wire, normal metal effectively, which normally when it gets hot it expands, uh, as the principles of physics sort of dictate, um, shape memory wire instead contracts, okay, so it can be uh, very useful in this application because obviously your body creates heat, we don't want these bone fixings to come apart, so when your body applies heat, the shape memory alloy constricts slightly and will hold those bones together tightly. Okay. An app another application you might be aware of that's a bit more commercial is in the use of glass uh, shape memory alloy and glasses frames. Okay, so if you've seen that advert where he holds the glasses in his hand and like scrunches them up into a little ball, okay, that's an example of the use of shape memory alloy. Now. You might question where the heat is generated, obviously it's in the friction of the, the part, so as you're kind of manipulating it with your hands, the, the, the friction is causing heat, that's making the shape memory alloy, shape memory alloy become hyper elastic or super elastic for that s small amount of time and then it will uh, allow it to uh, form into various different shapes without fracturing your glasses frames, Okay, so there's no problem if you sat on your glasses for example. Now another smart material you should be aware of is photochromic or photochromatic pigments, okay? This is um, a pigment or a, a colouring effectively or a dye that can change based on light. So photo is normally to do with light, chromic is normally to do with colour, okay? One application for this you might be familiar with is sunglasses that are adaptive, okay? So they change based on the, the light in the room. So for example, you could be wearing your sunglasses or your glasses inside. They might be coated with these uh, photochromatic uh, pigment and then when you go outside and it's much lighter, the photochromatic chromatic pigment goes darker and it protects your eyes from the, uh, the the sunlight there okay another application of these is in uh, welding goggles because um, I can't imagine you've done a lot of welding but if you do do any welding or you're aware of it it creates a very very intense light as you're joining the materials together the the, the steels that you're welding and that intense light can give you some very painful um, conditions called archaea which can damage your eyes so uh, if we apply photochromatic pigment to this as soon as that arc 
creates all that light, the welding glasses or the welding goggles will go completely black almost and only let a tiny amount of light through, thus protecting your eyes, just like sunglasses do. Another smart material you should be familiar with is thermochromic or thermochromatic pigment or it could also be applied to a polymer like strip okay so you've probably been um, you know you've you've had contact with a uh, thermochromatic strip okay in the the application of thermometers so if you've ever seen one of those forehead thermometers that you stick on your forehead and the color changes to show you what sort of uh, temperature your body's at okay that's an example of uh, thermochromatic or ther thermochromatic pigment on a strip of polymer okay but there's lots of applications for these as well and they're often linked to sort of safety applications so you might have a baby bottle for example that tells you at what heat or temperature it's suitable for a baby to drink I've seen these applied um, on plugs as well to show you what temperature the bath water is. Sometimes they apply them to sort of fun products as well like t-shirts and things that change colour based on your body heat. Now the last one I'm going to talk about, last smart material, is hydrochromatic uh, or hydrochromic pigment. Okay, Just like all the others, they've got that word chromic and you should remember that's to do with colour. In this case hydro. Uh, is to do with water or moisture, I suppose. Okay, um, some applications for this, obviously, it's it changes when it gets wet. Okay, so you might have um, a tester in a plant pot that shows you if the plant needs watering or not. And I've seen this applied to child's play mats as well. So you have these play mats where you give uh, children um, something to paint with in water, and then obviously the advantage of this is there's no cleaning up because as soon as the water disperses that vapor. Uh, disperses into the air the uh, the item can be painted on again I've also seen this in uh, umbrellas and things so as you go out in the rain it obviously changes color that shows some sort of design underneath the uh, uh, the wet parts now I'm going to talk a bit about composite materials as well and technical textiles now a composite material uh, definition of this effectively is two or more materials that are combined together to um, produce um, improved properties or to combine properties of different materials. Now, you could argue that alloys also have these sort of things. So an alloy is a mixture of two or more metals and you mix these together again to combine properties. The difference being with a composite, you can generally detect what the different materials are. So an example of this might be a carbon reinforced polymer or CFRP. Um, and what happens with this, obviously it's a combination of carbon strands and um, resin, okay, perhaps polyester resin or epoxy resin. And if you cut through the carbon fiber, you can generally see where the strands are and where the resin are. And the same could be said about most of these sort of composites, okay. So carbon, fi uh, carbon fiber reinforced plastic and glass fiber reinforced plastic, okay, GFRP, CFRP, okay, are both. Uh, got strands of either glass or carbon that are embedded in a resin sort of uh, matrix effectively. Now these are very very strong because they take the properties of the glass or the carbon and they're quite hard as materials as well. Okay, But it also allows them to form very complex and curved shapes so they can use these things for things like sports car bodies, um, performance bike parts, kayaks, surfboards effectively where you want a really strong hard surface but you also want to maintain the lightness of the material. Okay, So you can see there's a bit of a theme with these um, sort of composite materials and new materials like uh, titanium and metal foams where you want really strong materials that are also very light. Okay, And CFRP and GFRP are two examples of strong light materials as well. Now the only main difference between the two okay, is effectively the carbon fibre is generally seen as a little bit stronger but it's also at the moment a little bit more expensive to use than GFRP hence why it's more exclusive to sort of sports cars and expensive bike parts and perhaps uh, expensive tennis rackets and things like this whereas GFRP uh, again slightly lower in strength but um, the aesthetics are not maybe as good and therefore uh, it's a slightly cheaper application as well. Now some other examples of composites, you're going to be quite familiar with these, are the timber based composites okay, or in many cases manufactured board. Pretty much all manufactured boards are an example of a composite as well because they combine wood fibres or wood uh, veneers or strands of wood effectively with some sort of resin to kind of hold the parts together. So MDF, hardboard, chipboard, plywood, blockboard, OSB, okay, these are all examples of um, 
timber based composites and are obviously manufactured boards as well okay so it's a good one to remember if you're stuck for a composite material in an exam okay now these are applied for many many sort of uses okay but generally in furniture and in the construction industry and the benefits of using timber based composites I've discussed in a previous video on manufactured boards but obviously is that uniformity um, of the, uh, the the product, the ease of machining, and the fact that it comes in sort of stock sizes and things like this is going to be very beneficial in these um, applications. Another composite you're probably quite familiar with, obviously, is concrete. So concrete is a mixture of sort of aggregate aggregates and cement and stones in some cases. Okay, where you combine these together, and they're used often for things like construction and garden ornaments. Now the last topic I'm going to talk about is uh, technical textiles. So three uh, technical textiles you should be familiar with is Kevlar. Okay, so Kevlar was developed um, as a very very strong um, resistant material. Okay, and that's what's used for things like bulletproof jackets and motorcycle gear. Because obviously if uh, you fall off your motorbike, you're going to be resistant to a lot of force. So it's a very durable, very strong, very tough material. Okay, and Nomex which is a heat retardant material okay so it's going to be very protective to, to uh, against heat so things like firefighters clothing or if you're driving a racing car because obviously there's, there's a potential for crash there and uh, a lot of heat or you know resistance to fire in those particular cases both of these are registered trademarks as you'll see because they are produced by a company so that is not the uh, technical name for the uh, material it is the um, the registered trademark or brand name of the company that makes these uh, materials okay one other thing you should be familiar with is the use of conductive thread now conductive thread or I suppose normal thread effectively is cotton polyester or nylon okay whereas conductive thread is a nylon thread that has the ability to conduct electricity okay so this is quite useful if you want to make uh, some sort of smart textile uh, clothing where you want to connect up circuitry or LED lights or some sort of clever um, integrated electronics into your textiles product that you're producing you can use conductive thread effectively to connect up all of the components and all the parts of your circuit okay so that's a bit of a, um, a summary of um, new materials smart materials and I've touched upon composites and uh, um, smart textiles or technical textiles there as well please test yourself on some of the questions at the end to make sure you've got a good understanding and I uh, hope you enjoyed that